Hi everybody, today we're going to talk about using the Reynolds Transport Theorem to describe the transport of energy in a fluid system, resulting in something that we call the energy equation. So here's our review of the Reynolds Transport Theorem. We know that we have this thing called the system, where we have a fixed packet of mass that moves around. We have a thing called the control volume, which is a fixed region in space, and the control volume has a boundary that mass is able to cross entering and leaving our control volume. And the Reynolds Transport Theorem describes the transport of this property B, and it relates the Lagrangian and Eulerian perspectives of fluid mechanics. So in this case, we want to let B represent the energy of our system. So we have this capital E, and that would have units of joules. Then we have our lowercase b, that's defined as the E over M, the mass, and that's equal to a lowercase e we use to represent that intensive property. So these units would be like kilojoules per kilogram or joules per kilogram. I also want us to recall from thermo that we can expand the energy as a u, the internal energy, which is thermal, related to the temperature, plus the kinetic energy, plus the potential energy, which if we write it out in terms of the uh, properties of this fluid, we have U, the internal energy, V squared over 2 represents the kinetic energy, and then GZ represents the gravitational potential energy of the fluid. So that gives us the Reynolds Transport Theorem that looks like this. We have the rate of change of energy of the system with respect to time equals the rate of change of energy within the control volume with respect to time, plus the energy that entered and left the control volume with mass flow. From our thermodynamics class, we should recognize that the rate of change of energy within the system with respect to time can actually be written as the rate at which heat enters the system minus the rate at which work leaves the system. And remember, we've seen this a couple times before, at an instant when the system and the control volume coincide with each other, we can treat these as the same. So we're going to be able to replace that with q dot in minus w dot out. So that gives us an equation that looks like this. The rate at which work and heat enter and leave the system, or the control volume I should say, is equal to the rate of change of energy within that control volume plus the rate at which energy enters and leaves with the mass. And we could expand this term if we wanted to represent those three parts of the energy that we talked about. One of the terms that's work that's important to us is what's called the flow work. And this is the work associated with sort of pushing the mass into that control volume. So that's equal to the pressure times the area, that's our force, uh, times our velocity. So f dot v is kind of how we can look at this. And in the uh, integral form, where we're going to write this not assuming that everything is uniform, we're going to get our equation looking like this for the pressure work or the flow work. So let's uh, look at expanding our energy equation to account for that. So one component of the work is this pressure work. The other component is what we call the shaft work, which is um, the work associated with moving shafts. We could also have other types of work in there, as we've learned about from thermo, but this is really the main one that we're going to see in fluids class. And then the right-hand side remains unchanged. Well, let's look at what happens when I substitute in this expression for the pressure work, and I want to move it over to the other side, because look, we have an integral over a control surface, dA, and then we have times v dot n, we have v dot n over here, and the integral dA, so we can move that inside this parenthetical term, and we're going to get something that looks like this. So we have our q dot n minus our shaft work, we keep our energy of the control volume unchanged, but we've now expanded this term over here on the right. Well, those of you who are familiar with thermo should recognize this u plus p over rho 
In thermo, we used to write it as u plus p little v, the specific volume. Well, that is the definition of enthalpy, this property enthalpy that we talk about. So here's our first look at the energy equation, where we've replaced that term with the enthalpy that we talked about before. If we have a uniform velocity, meaning that this integral does not have a variable velocity throughout our control volume, if we have uniform energy throughout the control volume, meaning that we can bring the energy outside of our integral here, and it's incompressible, we can get ourselves to this equation. dE in the control volume dt equals q dot n minus the shaft workout plus the mass flow rate times h plus v squared over 2 plus gc over all the inlets minus the same sum over all the outlets. And you should recognize this as the first law of thermodynamics written for a control volume. So you can see that this Reynolds transport theorem and the first law of thermodynamics are very closely related. All right. One other thing that it's important for us to remember is that in thermo, we were able to relate changes in enthalpy to changes and uh, changes in internal energy to changes in temperature using the specific heats. So we have the specific heat with constant volume and the specific heat at constant pressure relating to the internal energy and the enthalpy respectively. So if we had constant specific heats, we assumed that they didn't change with temperature, we could write these approximate expressions for delta U and delta H. And we could also look at when we have an incompressible substance, we know that CV and CP are approximately equal and our delta H is basically just C delta T. Delta H and delta U are actually very close together for incompressible substances. One last interesting thing about the energy equation is that we can relate this to Bernoulli's equation. So let's start taking a look at Bernoulli's equation that we've seen before, looking at the relationship of pressure of our V squared, which is kinetic energy, and our GZ, which is the potential energy. Well, here is our form of the energy equation that we just talked about. If we have steady state, meaning DDT, there's no change with respect to time, and we have no shaft work, we're able to get an expression that looks like this. We have the pressure out over rho plus V out squared over 2 plus GZ out equals the pressure in over rho plus V in squared over 2 plus GZ in. This part is Bernoulli's equation, and then we subtract off U out minus U in minus Q net, where here we have the uh, heat transfer per unit volume. So in this case, where we had the uniform velocities, that's what we needed to do in order to get rid of that control surface integral, we're able to show that this is the Bernoulli equation plus this extra term. Well, it turns out that this extra term, the u out minus u in minus q net, this is losses in the useful energy. And the second law of thermodynamics is going to tell us that this term is always greater than or equal to zero. So let's look at that another way. Generally, we're going to use the energy equation in units of head, which we remember is units of distance, usually meters, in the SI system. So we have that written like this. Here's the part that we've seen before. This is our Bernoulli component up to this Zn. Then we're going to add in a term that we call H sub S, the shaft head, and then minus a term that we call H sub L, the loss head. And these two terms are ways that we're going to account for these things that we used to not include in the Bernoulli's equation. So if I look at my shaft head, I could define this like this. It's equal to the power, the shaft power into my control volume divided by m dot g or rho qg 
using uh, volumetric flow units. And then the loss head, or the head loss, is equal to just the loss energy rate divided by m dot g. And if we want to represent that loss, it's q dot plus the work loss, which would be due to things like friction and other effects there. So this equation, the energy equation in head form, represents a form of the Bernoulli's equation that can apply outside of the usual Bernoulli assumptions that we have to make, one of which is that it's frictionless and the other being that there's no work. We can do this because now we're able to account for these two terms that we had previously been assuming away in these two head terms that we correct the Bernoulli's equation using. So here are the examples that we're going to do in class. One is a steam turbine where we know V in and the enthalpy in. We know V out and the enthalpy out. And we're asked within the turbine to find the work produced per unit mass, assuming steady flow, adiabatic, and no change in altitude. So this problem is similar to things that you probably have done before in thermodynamics. Another problem that we're going to look at is pumped hydraulic storage. So here we're pumping water from one tank up to another tank, a distance of 30 feet. We know that the head loss is equal to 15 feet. That's our loss head, a, a measure of the lost energy associated with this process. And we know the work rate, how much work is being done uh, in this pump in horsepower, which we can convert to watts. And we're asked to find the volumetric flow rate and the total wasted power in this process. So that's it for this lesson, and I'll see you guys in class to work those problems.